Hi everyone, welcome back to the History in 20 podcast. Hope you've all had a good Christmas and New Year. I know it's been a while since I've done an episode, but here we are, back again. And today we're talking about one of the 16th century greats, and that is Suleiman the Magnificent. So, if you don't know anything about him, or just want a bit more information, we'll start off with a personal profile. So, he was born on the 6th of November, 1494, in Trabzon, in the Ottoman Empire, part of modern-day Turkey now. He died on the 6th of September 1566 in the Kingdom of Hungary, which was at the time under the Habsburg monarchy. He was 71 years old. And he reigned as 10th Sultan of the Ottoman Empire from the 30th of September 1520 until his death on the 6th of September 1566. He was married once to Mahi Devran Hurem Sultan. Um, they got married in, it was either 1533 or 34, and they were married until her death in 1558. And they had ten children, uh, including Sultan Selim II, who succeeded him, and he was part of the uh, Ottoman dynasty. So, a little bit of an introduction on him. Well, Suleiman the Magnificent, he was known more formally as Suleiman I, or Suleiman the Lawgiver in Turkish. And as I said, he was the 10th Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. And his reign spanned for 45 years, from 1520 to 66. And during this period, he oversaw a crucial era of the Ottoman Empire's history. So on top of being one of the most formidable leaders of all time, he still stood out, given the competition that he faced from Europe. So in this period as well, we have monarchs like Henry VIII of England, Francis I of France and Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. So he still stands out in that crowd, which says a lot about him. So we'll talk about his early life first. So from his birth in 1494 up to about 1520. So Suleiman was the son of another legendary Ottoman Sultan who was called Selim I. He reigned for eight years from 1512 to 1520. And who, like even despite his short reign, he oversaw a huge expansion of the Ottoman Empire, including the conquest of the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt from 1516 to 17. So during Selim I's reign, the Ottoman Empire increased in size by 70%. Um, and by the time of his death in 1520, it actually spanned 3.4 million square kilometres, which is 1.3 million square miles, all the way from Algeria to Moldavia. Now, Suleiman was born in November 1494, and although the date is often disputed, the 6th of November is generally agreed upon. So his father, as mentioned above, was Selim I, and his mother was a woman called Hafsa Sultan. So her origins are unknown, although it is clear that she converted to Islam at some point during her lifetime. So, age seven, Suleiman begun his studies at the Top Kepi Palace in Constantinople, where he undertook numerous subjects, including history, science, theology, literature, and military tactics, which is something that greatly contributed to his later life. So, when he was age 17, he was appointed governor at Kaffa, which you might remember from my previous video on the Black Death. Uh, I'll post a link up above or in the comments, um, which was a port on the Crimean coast of the Black Sea. <clears throat> um, excuse me, which is perhaps most famously remembered for its role in spreading the Black Death in Europe 150 years before Suleiman was born. So, starting with his early reign in 1520, upon his father's death in 1520, Suleiman ascended the throne and became the 10th Ottoman Sultan, but he wasted very little time in organising military conquests to further expand the territory of the Ottoman Empire. So in 1521 he began the first of a series of campaigns against Christian Europe, starting with Belgrade. So in mid-May 1521, he started to amass the Ottoman forces and they headed for Christian-held Belgrade. So the Hungarian army, because they were in control of Belgrade at the time, were unable to counter-attack against the Ottoman forces, and during the conflict they succumbed to Suleiman's forces. So the battle raged from the 25th of June to the 29th of August, and it was an Ottoman victory. And this victory was hugely significant for the Ottoman Empire, because it was the furthest west that it had ever expanded in its history. So he's been on the throne a year and he's already gone further west than the Ottoman Empire had ever been, so it's a great start to, to Suleiman's reign. So the following year, he targeted the Greek island of Rhodes. So in 1480, under the leadership of Meshir Pasha, the Ottoman Empire had been unsuccessful in taking the island stronghold from the Knights Hospitaller, who were a medieval Catholic military order which originated during the Crusades. However, under Suleiman's leadership, Ottoman forces managed to besiege the island successfully. 
So on the 26th of June, 1522, 400 Ottoman ships arrived on the shores of Rhodes to begin the siege. Two days later, Suleiman arrived to personally take charge, arriving with an army of 100,000 men. So the siege involved heavy gunfire and cannon fire, and in a show of advancing warfare in the early modern period, and the castle walls eventually began to crumble. So the siege lasted until the 22nd of December, when the representatives of Rhodes accepted Suleiman's rather generous terms, including one in which Suleiman promised not to turn any churches into a mosque. Now again, this victory was hugely significant for the Ottoman Empire because the capture of Rhodes meant that the Ottomans controlled almost the entire eastern Mediterranean, which made communications and trade much easier with their base back in Constantinople and the Levant. But Suleiman again looked further west and into Europe. Now, in 1525, Francis I of France, uh, who reigned from 1515 to 47, he'd been defeated at the Battle of Pavia by the forces of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Now, Francis was imprisoned and he was forced to sign the Treaty of Madrid, which ceded parts of his territory to Charles, as well as including his sister's marriage to Charles as well. So the treaty was signed on the 14th of January 1526 and as a result Francis was released from prison. However, as soon as he'd crossed the border back into France, he formed the League of Cognac with other European leaders in order to dethrone Charles V. And who did he turn to in the east? Suleiman. So Francis asked Suleiman to make war on the Holy Roman Empire. Now interestingly, the road from Turkey led through Hungary to reach the Holy Roman Empire. So fortunately for Francis and Suleiman, relations between Hungary and the Ottoman Empire had soured after Suleiman's conquest of Belgrade in 1521, and by 1526 they were at an all-time low. So as a result, this gave Suleiman the chance to attack Hungary later that same year, which led to one of the most famous battles of the 16th century, the Battle of Mohax on the 29th of August 1526. Now initially, although outnumbered, the advantage was with the Hungarians because their troops were well rested and they knew the territory, whereas on the other hand the Ottomans had just marched across Eastern Europe in the scorching summer heat. However, Suleiman's troops were much more disciplined than the Hungarian troops, who were also supported by a small contingent of Polish soldiers. So the Ottoman troops cut through the Hungarian defences and they forced King Louis II of Hungary to flee. Upon his retreat, he was thrown from his horse into a river and died, weighed down by his armour, so he drowned in the river. And he was only 20 years old at the time. So approximately 14,000 Hungarian soldiers were killed as a result of this, but Suleiman didn't stop there. Just two days later, he watched from his golden throne as 2,000 Hungarian prisoners were executed. Now again, this shows how Suleiman earned his epithet, the Magnificent, because the Ottoman Empire had penetrated further into Europe than it had ever been during its entire history, and it also ended the Ottoman-Hungarian Wars, which had raged in some form or other since 1366, as well as ending the Jagiellonian dynasty in Hungary with the death of Louis II. And, more importantly, if you look at the bigger picture, Suleiman had achieved all of this by the time he was just 32 years old. So, following the Battle of Mohax and the death of Louis II, Archduke Ferdinand I of Austria, who was also Charles V's brother, claimed the Hungarian throne. However, <clears throat> he was only recognised in Western Hungary. So there was a nobleman based in Transylvania called John Zapoloya, and he challenged Ferdinand for the throne. Now, Zapoloya was supported by Suleiman as he accepted vassal status in the Ottoman Empire, and this ultimately signified the collapse and partition of medieval Hungary, which was to last until 1700. So it was split between the Ottoman Empire, the Principality of Transylvania, and the Habsburg monarchy. So following the Diet of Pozny, which is modern-day Bratislava, on the 26th of October 1526, Ferdinand was crowned King of Royal Hungary, and there was a legitimate claim behind this, because he was married to Louis II's sister, Anna, and Louis had been married to Ferdinand's sister, Mary. So to enforce his claim on Hungary, Ferdinand captured Buda, which is modern-day Western Budapest, in 1527. But two years later, Suleiman reacted and regained control of Buda, then marched on to Vienna, and this was to be the most ambitious Ottoman expedition to the west. So, the Ottoman army at this point numbered about 100,000, 
um, and they'd marched through the majority of the European wet season, arriving outside the gates of Vienna on the 27th of September 1529. So huge torrential and cold downpours ensured that the Ottomans could not dig tunnels because the ground was sodden, and the defenders of the city kept filling them back up, with the mud turning into like a glue-like texture. So the 21,000 defenders of the city were led by a man called Nicholas Graf Salm, who was an imperial senior military commander who kept morale up and successfully led the defence of Vienna. So on the 14th of October, the siege was called off, which resulted in a humiliating defeat for Suleiman, who arrived back in Constantinople on the 16th of December 1529, having lost 15,000 troops compared to just 1,500 of the defenders. So this defeat left a sour taste for Suleiman and it marked the beginning of a bitter Ottoman-Habsburg rivalry that was to last right up until the 20th century. So in 1532, Suleiman again attempted to besiege Vienna, but he never reached the city as the Ottomans were delayed by the Siege of Guns, sometimes called the Siege of Kosciag, within Hungary. So due to conflicting sources, the outcome of this is actually unknown. So depending on which source you follow, either Suleiman, having been delayed for nearly a month, withdrew at the August rains, or the Croatian captain Nikola Juricic rejected to offer the, to off, rejected the offer to surrender on favourable terms. Either way, the defenders prevented Suleiman from reaching Vienna for a second time. So we'll fast forward a bit to 1536, and Suleiman formed a Franco-Ottoman alliance with Francis I, which was tactically one of the finest moves that Francis actually made as king keeping in line with the famous saying, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, because although he was obviously intimidated by Suleiman, he still had Charles V to contend with, and if he had uh, Suleiman on the east and Charles in the middle, then Charles could feel essentially trapped with the alliance between those two. So, following the two failed campaigns in Vienna in 1529 and 1532, and after making the alliance with Francis in 1536, Suleiman then saw an opportunity to redeem himself in the early 1540s when conflict erupted again in Hungary. So in 1541 and 44, the Habsburgs attempted to lay siege to Buda, but they were repelled by the Ottomans, who also captured two Habsburg fortresses in the process. So as a result, Ferdinand and Charles were forced to sign a humiliating five-year treaty with Suleiman. So for Ferdinand, this meant that he had to pay a fixed yearly sum to Suleiman for the Hungarian lands he continued to control, while also renouncing his claim to the Kingdom of Hungary. And significantly, the treaty referred to Charles V as King of Spain, rather than Holy Roman Emperor, which led to Suleiman to identify as the real Caesar. So, in the matter of just a few short years, Suleiman had penetrated into Europe, almost reaching Austria. He'd taken back Hungarian territory, he'd denounced Charles V as the Holy Roman Emperor, and he'd formed a Franco-Ottoman alliance which was to last for three centuries. So he's done pretty well in those years there, I'd say, for sure. So the next section we're going to look at is, I've decided to call, we'll call it Suleiman Further Afield, so Eyes on the East, because it wasn't just Europe that Suleiman was concerned with, and I don't just want a Eurocentric version of him, I want a whole version, so a rounded version of what Suleiman did. So, as I said, it wasn't just Europe that he was concerned with, so Persia was the thorn in Selim the first side, and Suleiman the Magnificent was determined not to make it the thorn in his side too. So the enemy was a rival Muslim faction called the Safavid dynasty. So in 1533, Suleiman led an army into Asia Minor, where he occupied Tabriz and took Bitlis without resistance. The following year, they made a push for Persia and found the Safavids ceding territory instead of engaging in a pitched battle. So by 1535, Suleiman entered Baghdad and restored the tomb of Abu Hanifa, and Hanifa was the founder of the Hanafi, Hanafi school of Islamic law, which the Ottomans followed. So Suleiman turned his sights even further east and he wanted to trade with the Mughal Empire which were based in South Asia. So in 1538 he captured the port of Aden in Yemen from the Portuguese and later in the year he solidified it as a base from where the Ottomans could trade in Asia. So obviously with its strong trade routes to both the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, the Ottomans enjoyed a significant level of trade with the Mughals in the 16th century, and Suleiman is even reported to have traded six documents with Akbar the Great, who was the third Mughal emperor. So it wasn't just east, uh, there was, well, south of the Ottoman Empire as well, 
in North Africa. So North Africa was another area where Suleiman focused his attentions on because he desperately wanted territory that would link the Ottoman Empire together. So from 1538 to 59, the Ottoman-Portuguese wars raged through North Africa and the Red Sea as both fought for the best trading locations. So when the 21-year conflict finally came to an end in 1559, the Ottomans had successfully expanded their influence in the Red Sea, while the Portuguese maintained control of the Persian Gulf. However, significantly for the Ottomans, they took the weakened Adal Sultanate into their territory, which further enhanced Ottoman expansion into Somalia and the Horn of Africa, helping to link the North African Ottoman territories closer together. So we're hopping from North Africa back to Persia now, and we're going on to Suleiman's second campaign in Persia, which was from 1548 to 49. So at this point, the Safavids once again refused to enter into pitched battle and use scorched earth tactics, exposing the Ottomans to the harsh winter conditions of the region. So the Ottomans left in 1549, but had managed to claim some territory in Van, Georgia and Azerbaijan. So, Suleiman the Magnificent's final campaign into Persia was his most successful, I guess you could say third time lucky. So in 1553 he recaptured Erzurum and crossed the upper Euphrates River, gaining territory in northern Persia. The Peace of Amasia was signed in 1555, which defined the borders of the Safavid and Ottoman empires. So Armenia and Georgia were equally split between the two, while the Ottomans also gained Iraq, which granted them access to the Persian Gulf to help with trade even more. Um, so even further afield we'll go to, in 1564, the Ottomans received a request for support against the Portuguese from Aceh, which is in modern-day Sumatra, all the way in Indonesia. Now if you put this into context for the 16th century, I mean we're talking like 1564, less than 100 years ago was the first time that Europeans, well, Euro Christopher Columbus had gone to America less than a hundred years ago so he'd gone west and we're talking like we're getting contacts here from the Ottoman Empire so from Turkey Constantinople Istanbul we're getting contacts from there right over to Indonesia which is mental to think about so anyway the Ottomans compli uh, complied and sent a fleet over now again this demonstrates how Suleiman earned his title his influence was known all the way from Austria to Indonesia and it's hard to imagine that any other monarch of that time would have had that much global influence. So he's certainly one of the most important characters and globally recognised names of the 16th century. So I've split the next bit up into sort of Suleiman's death and legacy, but just before we get there, I want to talk a bit about Ottoman culture under Suleiman the Magnificent. So as, as you've presumably guessed, the Ottoman Empire thrived under Suleiman the Magnificent as he presided over what became to be known as the Golden Age of the Ottoman Empire. So unlike many of his Islamic and Christian contemporaries, he actually protected the Jewish communities of the Ottoman Empire. So. In the early 1550s, he introduced what was called a Furman, which was a royal mandate, which denounced blood libels against the Jews, because his favourite doctor was a Spanish Jew called Moses Hamon. So Suleiman the Magnificent also developed a distinctly Ottoman culture. So while his father wrote poetry solely in Persian, Suleiman wrote in Persian and Turkish, and some of his verses have actually become famous Turkish proverbs, including one that says, Everyone aims at the same meaning, but many are the versions of the story, which is a really interesting quote, especially from a historian's point of view. So, Suleiman also helped to develop the architecture of the Ottoman Empire, and he oversaw the construction of 300 monuments during his reign, and he also oversaw the restoration of the Dome of the Rock and the old city walls in Jerusalem. So, Suleiman's death comes about on the 6th of September, 1566, um, he was en route from Constantinople to Hungary to lead another expedition. 71 years old and he's still leading expeditions into Europe. And he died. Um, so ultimately the Ottomans were successful in the, the uh, following Battle of Shigetva and Suleiman's death was kept secret from the troops so as not to affect their morale and his body was sent back to Istanbul where he was buried. And Suleiman the Magnificent is indeed magnificent for many reasons. So a successful military leader, he gained territory in Europe, Africa and Asia, so across three continents, while also maintaining and developing a successful culture in the Ottoman Empire. He protected its Jewish citizens, he expanded the empire to the largest it had ever been, and he dominated the seas from the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea to the Persian Gulf and even over to the Indian Ocean. 
so he was truly was a magnificent leader and thoroughly deserving of his title. So I hope you enjoyed this one. It's something I've gone about it in a slightly different format. With rather than a biographical point of view, I've gone from like his European conquests to further afield. Because I thought with Sulem and the Magnificent, I think that's an easier way. I didn't want to be dotting between Hungary, then off to Indonesia, or we're going to Africa now. Whoops, back to Constantinople. So I thought that was an easier way of doing it. But if you've got any feedback on what how you prefer it doing, just let me know in the comments below. Please don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.